Jesus' name. I'm going to need your help. Could you just clap your hands with me?
guys sing with me. When all I see is the battle. When all I see is the battle. You see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing to fear now. every struggle, every opportunity to a God who longs to be with us. God, we're so thankful. Can we lift this up for somebody who might be in a battle? Can you lift this up for yourself, for the person next to you? I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. 
It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Cause this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my battles. Yeah. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my up in this room come on this is how this is how i fight my battles this is how i fight my battles this is how i fight my battles. this is how i in every season this is how i fight my This is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. See, this is how we fight our battles. This is how I. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I. Can we fight a little bit together? Father, we stand in awe of a God who's never lost a battle. In the situations that are gathered under this room, we know that life gets hard. We know that circumstances change. We know that the storm and the winds may come and blow. But the thing that we're standing in awe of today isn't how crazy and hectic life can be. We stand in awe of you and only you. We stand in awe of a matchless great name. We're so thankful that in this season we get to remember that you loved us so much that you inserted yourself into our story. And so we can remember no matter how hectic the seasons get, 
that in this season we can press in and remind ourselves that you have never desired to leave us by ourselves. You've, desi you've desired to be Emmanuel, a God that is with us. So if anyone is in this place or watching online that feels lonely or broken or detached, let them find connection and community in this moment, in this place, in this time. Let the words that will be brought here reattach your people to you. Because we know that when we're surrounded by you, we have everything that we need. We thank you for this time. And as we continue to worship together, let us be able to say it was good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. You can celebrate that God is with us. Amen. It's all right to clap your hands for a God that's here with us. Oh, sit down. I, you get, I get nervous when you stand up too long. <laughs> can you greet somebody as you sit down? It is so good to be here, and it's the season to just remember what God is doing. And we wanted to just sing a couple more songs to remind ourselves of that, if that's okay. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Heart the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king hark the herald angels sing hark the herald hark the herald hark the herald angels sing hark the herald angels Glory to the newborn King. Sing with me now. Peace on earth and mercy, my God and Savior's reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. The newborn king. Glory to the newborn king. Jesus was born in the manger land. Jesus was born in the manger land. The Son of God is here today. Oh, With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Heart the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Good morning. You guys doing all right this morning? Yeah, yeah. So I talked to a friend this week, and he said uh, he's in a different um, business than, than we are here. And uh, he said, you know, we're just winding down right now. It's kind of a relaxed uh, time of the year for us. And I just thought, 
Must be nice. Why don't you come volunteer here for a little bit, you know? Get out here and do something. Uh, so if you're um, not familiar with what we do here at SCG, uh, Christmas is a pretty big season for us. Is um, we, uh, last, I think it was a Thursday night, we just had a concert here. Who was at that concert? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Natalie Grant and Danny Goki, we did a concert. And then last night we had a huge party where we had a snow sledding hill. Um, one of my children bled from it. It was great. It was a great time. We had a lot of fun. So um, uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a fun season so far. And it's obviously going to continue on through this next week with all of our Christmas Eve services. Um, I, I would admit, I got to confess something just real quick, is uh, my wife is more busy than I am during this season because she's a singer and they request her to sing and I've never been requested to speak anywhere. And um, I'm not bitter. And, uh, and so I've had a lot of kid time this last few weeks. A lot of kid time, just me and the kids. I'm over it. I'm real over it. In fact, it's becoming increasingly difficult to celebrate the birth of any children right now. So I'm going to pray through it, and we're going to celebrate together this week. All right. Um, okay, so here's the deal, is uh, Christmas Eve services. We have a bunch of them. On the 23rd, we have our family service at 6 o'clock. And so um, that is the one that you want to bring all your kids to. Uh, you, uh, you can uh, worship alongside them, and it's pretty wild. It's really fun. We do some extra stuff. It's different than the other Christmas Eve services that are on the 24th. And those ones are at 1, 3, and 5, okay? So you can do both of them, and you're not going to see the same thing. Um, totally different experience. And so on the uh, 23rd at the family service, everybody is welcome. But if you don't want to bring the little, little, ones in the nursery will be available and then champions club as well and then there are um for the uh, the 24th the one three and five there's going to be kids services at all of them and champions club at the three o'clock and so um we we kind of uh, encourage you to invite your friends and your family we know that this is the one time of the year in which they're most open to coming to a church service and so we made it really really easy for you to invite some people and so here's what you got to do is you go ahead and take out your phone real quick Take out your phone, and you're going to text this number, and you text the word Christmas to it, and so the number is 313131, and what it will do is it will respond back with an invitation, a digital invitation that you can either post on your social media, you can uh, save it and forward it to your friends and just say, hey, come check this out. We, we pretty much made it as easy as possible without driving to your friend's house ourselves, Okay is to invite your friends and your family. And so make sure you do that. And throughout the service, if you go, oh, I should invite them, or maybe there's a, a low point during the sermon, which Doyle's speaking today, so there might be a lot, um, you can invite some people as well. So, yeah. <laughs> Remember you did me a couple weeks ago? It was the whole thing. Anyway, all right. Um, uh, last thing is uh, no service on the 25th, 26th. That's not true. There is service. It's just online. All right. So because uh, we're going to have all those services leading up to the weekend, we decided to uh, give everybody a little bit of a break and allow them to worship at home. And so we do have a special service that we're going to be doing. It will just be online for the 25th and the 26th. Okay. Uh, also, the last thing is we just want to thank you guys for being faithful in your giving is uh, you guys have really stepped it up. And we mentioned to you, hey, we're coming a little bit short to the end of the year here on our, on our budget. And so if you can step up and just give a little bit of extra, that would be awesome. And you guys have been doing that. We encourage you to continue to do that. And then uh, we also had a special project that we did with uh, uh, Guatemala. And I think, Doyle, you're going to mention that in a few moments here. But you guys have done an incredible work there as well. But before Doyle comes up, I think we have one more song. Mm -hmm. Wise man following Brightest star down to Bethlehem, they came far for the coming again of the one that's ever been. And when they found him, they fell on to the ground and joined the angels shouting, singing all around him. Say, hallelujah, hallelujah, that's what the angels cry. Hallelujah, hallelujah, precious little child. Hallelujah, hallelujah, sound of the angel's joy. Hallelujah, hallelujah, little baby boy. King of every king, prince of peace and everything. God with us and he's the only one that has ever been. So when we found him, we fell on to the ground and joined the angels shouting, singing all around him, say hallelujah, hallelujah, that's what the angels cry, hallelujah, hallelujah, precious little child, hallelujah, hallelujah.
That's what the angels cry. Hallelujah, hallelujah, precious little child. Hallelujah, hallelujah, sound of the angels' joy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, the front third of the room got that. Uh, Let's try it again. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, that's what I see. Some of you, you're already Christmas fatigued, aren't you? I can tell. Well, you better wake up today because we're going to do Christmas and we're going to have fun doing it. And uh, so here's what I want you to do first. First, I want you to turn to somebody and say whether you are or are not a good gift receiver. So I, uh, I had a theory, um, I had a theory that people who are good gift givers are good gift receivers, but last night they totally disagreed with me, almost booed me off the stage. Those people on Saturday night, they're jerks, I just want you to know that. So here's the deal, I have been told I am not a great gift receiver, all right? Because in my mind, I'm going, oh, great, another tie. But I think with my face, I'm saying, oh, thank you. But evidently, I'm saying, oh, great, another tie. Everybody can read my face. They all look at me and they go, we're tired of buying for you because you're never excited. Well, for me, this is kind of pretty much, you can't afford anything I really want. So, um, (laughs) isn't that terrible? Uh, It's it's interesting. Uh, Being a gracious gift receiver, I think is pretty important for us. And uh, one of the worst cases that, I wasn't there that day, but we go to Africa pretty often, at least we did until COVID, and and work with a lot of churches and and children, uh, uh, orphanages and schools and stuff like that. And uh, in one village, in a village development program that we uh, get involved in, uh, a family who is not really a part of our church, but uh, uh, we're friends of people in our church and ask if they'd come along, and, and they got really connected to uh, this one village. And so they actually were able to fund the building of a school, a medical um, clinic, uh, and a church. And so when they went back a couple of years later to dedicate, I didn't happen to be there the day I was off teaching somewhere. And, uh, I, they told me a story though. Uh, the, the villagers had been so excited at them coming to do the dedication, they'd been saving up a special gift. And so through an interpreter, they expressed their gratitude. Uh, the chief of the, the village uh, expressed their gratitude to this couple from here in Orange County. And I mean that in the worst possible sense. <laughs> anyway, that's mean. That's mean. I, I meant it. So, um, so the chief comes out and he goes, and we have been saving a special gift for you. And they lead out this big old goat. They've obviously been feeding this thing for a year. I mean, it's big. It's, and, 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 and so they start to say to the interpreter, oh, we can't accept it. And the interpreter says, no, no, you must accept it. You must, they'll be very offended. They've been feeding this goat. It's a great honor. You must receive the goat. And so they, oh, thank you, thank you. And, they t- and immediately, I, this, you know how some dogs can sense fear? You know, in people who don't like, immediately this goat begins to climb on her. And it's got its feet up right here. And she's looking face to face with a goat, which I'm pretty sure in Orange County, she's never, ever done. And, and they said they looked around for Alex, who's kind of the head guy that, you know, we work with there. And he's over behind a tree laughing so hard. He doesn't want the villagers to see him because they don't understand what's going on. But he knows how uncomfortable. This is. And so finally he comes out from the tree and he says, oh, we'll take care of whatever. And, and the kids at the uh, orphanage had a great meal that night. But anyway, um, <laughs> don't owe me. 
the only meat those kids had that month. Anyway, so, uh, so receiving a gift graciously, is, is, it takes some ability. It takes some uh, talent. And I want to talk about Christmas because I want us to be gracious gift receivers. All right? There are all kinds of ways to receive, most of them bad, but there are some good ways to receive gifts, and I want us to talk about that. But let me give us context here. So the context we've been talking about this, uh, this season is churchmas, not Christmas, churchmas. Oh, you took the Christ out of Christmas. Listen up. Uh, you can't have, the first week we learned, you can't do Christmas without, without the church. We all worry about taking Christ out of Christmas. What about the mus out of Christmas? Do you know what that stands for? It stands for mass. Christ Mass. It's a church service. Christmas is a church service. It's not a holiday. It's not a buying spree. It was and always has been a church service for, to honor the birth of Christ. So Christmas, by definition, involves the church. Last week we learned that, that um, Christ came and he came from, and, and we and looked at, at all of the lineage of Christ and some pretty wild people in that lineage. And he came from sinners two sinners, four sinners. He came from a group of people to leave behind a group of people, his lineage and his church. You see, we as Christians must understand it is not just us individually following Jesus. What did Jesus leave behind? Yes, salvation for individuals, but a body, a new family called the church that was to carry on his mission to extend his love and his hope and his grace to the world in which we live. And we are the church. And one of the things we must do is accept that privilege, opportunity, and responsibility of being the church, quit seeing ourselves just as individual and even consumers of salvation, but understand that we have joined a new family, and in this new family, we have the privilege of traveling together, of impacting our world, and being changed in the process. So that's the context that we're talking about today. Now, Christmas. It's interesting because throughout history, um, the church hasn't always celebrated Christmas. As a matter of fact, Jesus said to remember the cross, not his birth. We're not even really sure when it took place. We're pretty sure, pretty close to where it took place. But throughout history, once Christians began to celebrate Christmas, it wasn't even always the same time. And there was this ongoing, even in the Western world, there was this ongoing battle about celebrating Christmas because Christmas, the celebration of Christmas, kept ta- taking left turns. They te- kept, kept taking both Christ out of Christmas and the Mass out of Christmas. And it just became, for example, um, in England, it became just a time for poor people to go demand things from wealthy people. Now, give us a figgy pudding. That's not nice and friendly. That's a threat. Literally, it's a threat. If you don't give us treats, we will trash your house. That's what that's really about. And so you find this interesting thing. If you study the Christmas history, uh, the history of Christmas, you will find that sometimes it was raucous and crazy and awful, and the church actually rejected it. Don't celebrate Christmas. And then there are other times when the church tried to reinsert themselves into Christmas and say, no, it's not about being crazy. It's about the Christ of Christmas. You remember Dickens, uh, the Christmas Carol? You guys remember that? Three people. You have to do better than this, people. I got a lot of good stuff. You have to keep up. Let's go. Uh, so uh, here's the deal. And, and, and you need to understand the backdrop. So, so is it, uh, what's, his, what's his name? Scrooge. Just checking. <laughs> Eight of you got it right. Scrooge has a, a, a change of heart because he, he gets the Christmas spirit, right? And what does he do? He has this change of heart as evidenced by he sends a prized turkey over to Cratchit's house, right? And he writes a check or, or gives money to a, a charity for poor people. Remember? Got that? Now, here's what you don't understand. You think, oh, that's nice. That's good. Here's what, that was a part of the battle I was talking about between how we should celebrate Christmas. There had been a time where it was raucous. It was rambunctious. People would stay home and hide if they're good, God-fearing people because it was so drunken, so much drunkenness and craziness. But there was at a time when the church and culture itself was beginning to remember what Christmas is about. And Dickens, whether intentionally or not, was caught up in this reform movement of Christmas saying that if you have a a real Christmas. You don't end up with a hangover. You end up with a changed heart. 
And in his period of time, when he was writing that, it was an evidence that you had experienced Christmas if you gave gifts to people you loved and you extended charity to the poor. And you're saying, well, yeah, that's how Christmas was. But that's not how it was before. Dickens was actually taking sides in this deal, helping shape a different kind of Christmas. I think we at church have an opportunity to move Christmas and life in general to another level, to a deeper level, where we understand how essential God is, how essential the Christ that came in that manger is to all of our lives and to our society in general. And if we drop the ball, it's going to go one direction. If we pick up the opportunity, the challenge, it's going to go a different direction. And I believe at Christmas, we get to re recommit ourselves to influencing our society toward Jesus. Because the Christmas we know, which is about home and, and hearth and family, and yes, commercialism and I get all that, but it's much more about home and family and charity than it was at many times throughout history. How much more could it be about God if we as Christians stood up and kind of owned it? Right? And so I want to talk about how we as Christians, by the way, just to, to prove that I'm, I'm not making this up, there were people who were so... Um, upset that Christmas was so, such a, a terrible event. Matter of fact, in our own history, in this country, the Puritans uh, outlawed Christmas, um, and people still snuck a little feast on that day or whatever it was. But it, it was because people were missing the point. They were focusing on the celebration and not the Christ. So uh, there was a group called the Society for the Prevention of Useless Giving. Spug, for short. I'm not making this honest to goodness true. This is really true. It was started by a bunch of wives who said all the women, ha all the women have to do all the work, all the gift making, all the, all the feast making, and frankly, we're tired of it. Let's cancel Christmas. Some of you feel a little like that right now probably, or will in a couple of days. But what if Christmas was infused with the real meaning, the real point of Christmas? You see, the gift at Christmas is not what we give each other. It is not even the, the time of year with its warm fuzzies. The gift of Christmas is that God came. And the only reason that God came was uh, because of grace. Grace. Remember when the angel said to Mary, you are favored. And the King James says, you are highly favored. Favored. What does favored mean? It doesn't mean you're my favorite. I like you better than I like all the other people. That's not what it means. It means you are graced unmerited favor. You are graced. I am going to give you a gift. I'm going to do something in your life you don't deserve. You can't pay me back. I am just going to grace you with this. What if the church of Jesus Christ, we believers, begin to understand how incredibly powerful God's grace is? And that it is not just to us as individuals to be forgiven for our past, to be a, a ticket into heaven, but that we are given grace in order to grace others and what might just be missing in our society for all of our finger pointing and all of our, all of our political, what if the thing missing in our society is an abundance of and evidence of grace? What if we, who are said to have received God's grace, we are favored. We have been brought into relation with God, and yet we are failing to receive and extend God's grace in the kinds of ways that it's needed in our society. What if that is the issue going on? It's not their fault or their fault or their fault. It might be a little closer to home. Today, I want to encourage us to look at Joseph and Mary and understand some things they did. And how God's grace sustained them and how it changed everything. I found this acrostic for grace. I don't know where I found it somewhere. God's resources available to Christians everywhere. I actually like the definition of unmerited favor. But it's a good reminder that if we have received God's grace, we will do more than the Dickens character and just slightly change our heart. We will change the world. So let's look at some things here. We receive God's grace for some reasons. Let me begin in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 with 30. It's, it's uh, yeah. In the sixth month of Elizabeth, Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town of Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. I suggest to you that maybe if we were to find grace, that we would not be a, a church that is distracted or afraid, but a church that is fearless, 
full of Christians who are fearless. Let's, let's read about uh, in Matthew, about uh, Joseph, Matthew 1, 18. Uh, this is how the birth of, the, of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Do not be afraid. You know, it's interesting. I, I have this, this little honorary streak in me, and, and, uh, and I, I like to say Merry Christmas. And I like to say it loudly everywhere. I kind of like it because I kind of think it tweaks some people, and that's why I say it loudly. Uh, I, I just, Merry Christmas is a good thing to say, because I don't wish them a happy holiday. I mean, it's okay if they have a happy, happy holiday, but what I really wish for them is a Merry Christmas, where they really come to understand what Christmas is about, because it's changed my life. It changed your life, right? That's what I really want. But I, it, here's an interesting thing, and it's a nice thing to say to people out there, and we say it to each other, and it's nice, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. But what if we actually went biblical with our greetings? You know, Jewish people say shalom, which is, entails a whole lot of cool things, right? Uh, and when they come and when they go, what if you and I begin to, th- let's get more biblical about it. You know what the number one greeting during the first Christmas was? Do not be afraid. <laughs> right? Isn't that it? <laughs> Mary, Joseph, even, even Zachariah when he found it, do not be afraid. So what are we doing? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Not, we can even switch up and go King James. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. <laughs> Fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. I just wonder if sometimes we just went a little more biblical with our lives. Merry Christmas is nice. Fear not might even be important. If you think about the first Christmas, think about the first Christmas, there's some fear going on, right? There was fear. Mary, like she's giving a baby to her first child, giving birth to her first child. Never had a baby before. I got a feeling there's some fear there, don't you think? Here's Joseph. He's clueless, man. He's like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> right? Even Herod was in fear. And he had all the power. Right? There's fear everywhere. Angels, fear not. Even to the shepherds. Fear not. I think there's a lot of fear of this Christmas too. I think there's a lot of fear. I think there's fear of what is to come, and fear of this pandemic thing, fear of each other. I think it's hard for people to even talk to each other anymore because we're, we're afraid they might be on the other side. Fear. What if God's word to you this Christmas, I have come to give you grace so that you would fear not. <laughs> I've come to give you grace so that you don't fear anything. What a powerful thing for us to remember is that Christ has come. And what, 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 what are you going to do? I used to have a friend who's married five times before he became a Christian. He said, I've been married five times. You can't say anything to offend me. I've heard it all. <laughs> He's been with the same woman now, 30 years, his wife, and Christ made that a difference. But as Christians, I kind of want to say, what, what are you going to do that's going to offend me? I've been forgiven for everything I've done wrong. My character is growing by leaps and bounds. I know where forever is going to be. What do you got? Come on. And yet I do give it in fear. Just like you, I give it in fear. And some of it's irrational. Some of it seems kind of rational. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm in his care. I'm, I'm in his control. He came and he's given me grace to deal with it. Why would I ever live in fear? You see, here's the deal. We need to stop living in fear and start living in favor. Mary, you are favored. You are graced. I have grace. I am favored, not favored over somebody else. I am favored in a way I should never be favored. God loves me in a way and does things for me in a, in, in a way that I don't deserve. I can't pay him back. I can't believe how good he is to me. I am not to live in fear. I am to, to walk in favor. Fear drives so many of us to do so many things. I think even as churches, we struggle with fear. But the truth is that The government's not in control of my life. The stock market is not in control of my life. God is in control of my life. The Christ child came so that that could be true and I can walk without fear. By the way, you're saying, well, I'm not afraid. Yeah, you know, fear hides as anger. You know that, right? It parades itself as indignation, righteous or otherwise. It hides itself in all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it's still fear. 
fear of intimacy, fear of the future, fear of failure. There's all kinds of stuff. And yet the Christ child came. The angels announced, do not be afraid. 1 John 4, 18, perfect love casts out fear. There is no reason to fear. So I think as a beginning, if we're going to be gracious receivers of the gift of Christmas, we need to become fearless. Not in our own might, not to, you know, whistling in the dark, pretending we're more than we are, but just simply humbly acknowledging that we're in God's care. Therefore, I don't need to fear anything. I think another thing is, as the church, as Christians, we need to learn is to rise above impossibilities. In many ways, the last 18 months to two years has felt impossible. I never dreamed a government, for good reason or not, would ever shut our church down, or that we'd have to meet for months in a tent, or that in any given moment they could announce that we can't do what we do. There's all reason to fear and impossibilities, and yet God is, is more than that. I, I love I love the story of Mary. I read a moment for you uh, that, but let me let me give you a little more of that. Um, let me just kind of repeat verse thirty-two. He will uh, in Luke chapter one. He will be great and be uh, called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And here's Mary. I just love her. She's probably a fourteen year old girl, fifteen year old girl. How will this be? For I am a virgin. She's not in denial about this whole thing. Oh, this is great. She's like, what are you talking about? It's good. It's good. And I also love the response of the angel. He didn't really tell her. No, he's got to trust God on this one. The power of the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you anyway. That's all. That's it. I think that God calls us to do the impossible pretty often. That God calls, and if God calls us to do the impossible, it's not our responsibility to do the impossible. It's our responsibility to let him do the impossible. Mary didn't go run around trying to figure out how to get pregnant by God's child, with God's child, right? She just said, yes. Said, yes, Lord, let it be unto me as you have said. One of the things we have to do is we have to say yes to God, even in what looks like impossible situations. The truth is that it may look impossible, but if God is with you, See, that's the whole problem with the book of Ecclesiastes. It, it, it excludes God from the equation. You take God out of the equation, things are pretty dark and pretty hopeless in many cases. But if God is here, if God is with us, Emmanuel, God is with us, there is no impossibility. If God chooses to move mountains, he will move mountains. Maybe the greeting should be, do not fear, or God is with you. <laughs> Mary, God, God is with you. God is with you. Reminding people that God is with them might help them face the challenges that, that, that they're up against, the, the impossibilities of their life. And yet, here is a virgin who gave birth. That's the whole point. It was predicted in the Old Testament. It was going to happen that God doesn't worry about your impossibilities. Let's worry about and think about his power. I think we live as if the virgin birth didn't happen and that God isn't that powerful. And that with God, not all things are possible. There's someone in our family um, um, who, uh, whenever you give them a gift, they immediately ask for the receipt because you know they're going to return it. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but the initials are Cody. <laughs> and uh, and honest to goodness, my wife, one of the greatest gift givers uh, in history, uh, not as good as God, but really good, <laughs> has, has been uh, reduced to uh, handing, um, you know, little credit cards with money on them because she knows he's going to take it back. It's like taking it back. It's, it's, it's awful. I hope you shame him for it later. <laughs> it's ungrateful. It's... God came to a manger to extend grace, but do we receive it? Do we receive it or do we just kind of nod it? Oh, it's a nice story. That's a nice fairy tale. That's a nice thing. Because if it's really true, and there really was a virgin that gave birth to God incarnate, then anything you're facing and anything you're called to do is absolutely possible. You see, what happens, because it's so hard to understand, to believe that a virgin birth happened, that God is really that powerful, or that he would intervene in our lives to really, on a practical level, to do that, oftentimes we so, uh, some, on some level, reject that, that we give up his plans for our life, which are much greater than ours, and settle for our own plans, which are so much smaller. 
Mary never dreamed, hoped of, as a little girl, I'm going to give birth to the Messiah. That never entered into her mind. But God had something else in store for her. What if the same is true of you and I? We dream these dreams and God's going, but that's so small. I created you for so much more. But because we exclude the gift out of the realm of possibility, we don't truly receive the supernatural part of, of who God is. We don't receive that supernatural part of grace that is extended to us. We limit who we can become and what we can do because we have tried to limit God. God will call you to do the impossible. Think about gift giving is interesting. I have a brother, I'm going to tell you another story about him in a minute, but I have a brother who sends gifts and they are hilarious. They are funny. I can't even tell you in public the last gift he sent me. It's not, it's, it's just crude. It's not dirty or anything. It's just crude, but stinking funny. But, uh, and because growing up in my house, we didn't make Christmas lists. You didn't tell people what you wanted. It was just all supposed to be a surprise because gift is supposed to be, right? Isn't a gift just supposed to be, right? Yeah, see, somebody who's an anti-list person like me. And by the way, let me just give you a little thing about gift giving. If you're giving a gift because they're going to give you one, that's not a gift. That's transactional, okay? That's business, all right? Okay, just want to clear that up. So anybody offended yet? I'm really trying. Anybody offended? I'm trying to get somebody. So <laughs> that's so funny. Anyway, I don't know. I'm self-editing right here, right now. Just things I'm not, I'm not going to tell you about. Um, so... One of the things about gift giving that I love is the surprise element. You open it up and you go, oh, what I asked you for two weeks ago. Great, thanks. I hate that. I want to open it up and go, what? <laughs> I don't care if it's a good what or a bad what. Just I want a what. You know what I'm saying? It's like, what? Huh, what? I, I want that. That's what I want in gift giving, right? I was uh, in my prayer time this week and I was praying about this talk and I was talking to God about how sometimes gifts are surprises. And uh, I was thinking about the surprises I've had because of the gift of Christmas, the gift of God's grace, the gift of salvation. And me standing here talking to all you people, that's not the, I mean, that's kind of surprising given who I am, but that's not the biggest gift. I mean, the biggest surprise. I realized that probably the biggest surprise is that, that God would have me. The next biggest surprise is that he gave me the wife and the kids and grandkids that I have. They all have more character than I'll ever have, and they're greater people, nicer people than I am. I'm telling you, honest to goodness, even <laughs> that one. But then, I never said this before, I never recognized it before, but then I realized, and as I'm, I'm typing my prayer out, in my heart, my heart is the biggest surprise. You see, when I was first a Christian, I was kind of white knuckling my way through this thing, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I can't do that, and I can't do that, and I can't do that, and I can't do that. I really wanted to. I really want to do that one. I really want to do that one, but I can't do that. And I realized that over the years, as I've submitted to God, without me even really being aware of it at times, He has slowly changed my heart. And I still have, you still know I'm a hot mess. We, we understand that, right? And yet, my heart doesn't want to be a hot mess. My heart doesn't even want that thing anymore. My heart doesn't want that. I don't, I don't, I don't want self-gratification in that way. And, and, and I don't want that kind of reputation so people will admire. I don't want that. I, what I, I'm really realizing God is changing the very core of who I am. I really do want just more and more. Not every day, not every minute. I still Paul pray to stupidity on a regular basis. But I want, in my heart of hearts, I want what he wants for me. Because I'm realizing there's nothing greater. There's no amount of fame. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of anything that can replace knowing that I'm right in the center of God's will. I am right where he wants me to be. I'm being the man as best I can with his help, who he wants me to be. I'm being the husband. I'm being the father. I'm being the grandfather. I'm being the pastor. I am being that. That is a surprise that I am become, and, and in becoming that person, I'm, I'm a little shocked. I'm, I'm very shocked. And yet, I want to suggest to you that as we choose to follow Jesus, we choose to accept the grace that, was, that came to us is that he begins to change us. And we find ourselves being the kind of people we would always want to be, but never really could get ourselves there. What a powerful thing that is. You see, we move from being the church <laughs> distracted or the church intimidated to being the church triumphant. I know that's a theological term that refers to something else, but I'm going to steal it. The church triumphant, overcoming the impossibilities that we face. Now, I need to tell you this. 
I talked to a lot of younger leaders, and especially the ones here. They sense that coming is, is, is more, uh, the culture will be more and more antithetical to the church and the gospel. But God is preparing them for it, and they are ready for it. And the impossibilities of a culture you live in doesn't stop God's work. The impossibilities of the family you were born into does not stop God's work in your life if you receive the gift of Christmas. The impossibilities that you think are impossible, God looks at him and he goes, no, nah, not so impossible. We could do something with this. I think we need to be the church fearless, the church triumphant, if you will. Let me just read a passage from Matthew about Joseph. All this took place and fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. If God is with us, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. And then maybe the last observation I would make about this is found in Luke 1, 33. It's the church fearless, the church triumphant, and maybe the church effective. I think the world needs a church right now. <laughs> You've probably noticed if you go out this way, if you go out that way today, go out that way. Because we've got a little Christmas village out there. You've seen a new addition to our Christmas village, and it's a little white church. And it's right dead center. And there's a reason that's there. We've always thought we had, should have a church, but we had kind of a big one right here. But we wanted a church. But here, here's where it came real for me. In, in, in the old world, in Europe and so on, uh, most villages were built around the church. The highest point in the city usually was the church. The highest thing, highest building was the church. Even in New England, you can drive through little villages, little towns, and find the church is, is the center. And it was the center of, of much of, of life in a village, as it should have been. And not everybody was a Christian, not everybody lived out the faith, and yet it was a rallying place, a place where they found their foundations, where they found how to treat each other, even if they didn't live up to it. I was in a new development recently, in, and I can't remember honestly where it was at, but it was a suburb of either Sacramento or Phoenix, I can't remember which one. Uh, and it was a new development, and they had built a, a kind of an old world looking village for their little downtown business and shopping area. And it, sure enough, it led up to a point, and the tallest building was right there. And it was a bank. <laughs> and I went, oh my goodness. I think I understand what's going on. I think I understand. If our lives have revolved around commerce, if our lives revolve around anything but God, the perfect God, the one who can lead us into a different kind of life, a different way of treating each other. If our lives revolve around anything else, there are flaws, there are holes in the foundation, there are going to be cave-ins, there are going to be collapses, there are going to be catastrophe. Our lives have to be built on that grace that was extended in the manger with sacrifice on the cross and was resurrected so that you and I could walk in grace every day. Not just you and I individually, you and I need to provide foundations for a different kind of society. A lot of people trying to find some good, some good to fight for, some cause to fight for. But the problem is the foundations are flawed because man's motives are flawed. Only God is pure. And only God's grace can lead us to greater and greater purity. We need to be the church and we need to be the church effective. I think about Joseph and Mary Think about what Joseph must have been thinking when he found out his fiancée was pregnant. And he knew he had nothing to do with it. I think about Mary. Was she truly excited or was she scared to death? 14-year-old girl, I've been scared to death, I think. Here's what I think about them. Somehow they had the courage, Joseph, to go ahead and take her as his wife and not really be with her, if you will, for her to say yes to the angel. And here's, I think here's the learning from that. Sometimes we can't tell the difference between a coffin and a crib. Sometimes when we think our dream is dying. Okay, Joseph, I'm going to grow up. I'm going I'm to marry. Uh, I'm going to marry Mary. And we're going to have a couple of kids. We're going to stay in the village. It's going to be great. What looked like the death of a dream was the beginning of a vision. Mary, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to marry Joseph. We're going to have two little kids that look like us. It's going to be... And yet there was this angel visitation that said, no, nope, it's not going to work exactly like that, not right now. But something greater is going to happen. Something I've seen in my own life in the last year, and it's probably been the hardest year of ministry I've ever done. Something I learned many years ago, but I had to relearn it this year in a tough way. 
The Bible says that a seed has to fall to the ground. It has to die. It has to be buried in order to give new life. Sometimes our dreams have to die. But what we thought was a coffin is actually a crib. I want to suggest to you that there are many things in our, in our world, in our country, in our culture that feel very much like death to me. And yet, could there be a new birth if the church would just rise up with the grace that we've been given, with the unmerited favor? If we would just rise up in what smells of death in so many ways to me, what if we rose up with grace to bring new life? A new understanding, just as happened with Christmas in Dickens' day, what if life itself could be redefined by God's definition and not somebody else's, and we quit giving in to death, and we start bringing life everywhere that we go by simply extending God's grace? I was talking to my brother this week. My brother pastors a little church out in a cornfield in Illinois, and uh, his wife, is uh, her family is from Kentucky. And um, in their little part of Kentucky, where his, her cousins live, her parents were raised, a tornado hit this week. And uh, with that connection in mind, my brother loaded up his truck in a little trailer they had with all the generators and all the water and clothes and everything he could find. And they began to shuttle, about six and a half hours away, shuttle back and forth to Kentucky Supplies. First, it was hard to get in, but they were able to find somewhere to sell uh, that, that they knew there. And they found a little, a little Pentecostal church in a little town where their family's from. And they said, you can use our church. Everything else is wiped out, but the building's still standing. You can use this to warehouse stuff, and we'll help you hand it out. And so they start hauling stuff in and unloading stuff by hand, and, and, uh, and everything's just devastated. And, and my brother said the, sh- the most shopping, shocking thing was that people looked like zombies. They were just in shock. And they couldn't even receive receive what they were trying to give them. They had to convince people to take it because they were just so shocked. Everyone lost someone they loved. Everyone lost family members. It was awful. And they're unloading these things by hand and, and trip after trip. And finally, the guy shows up. And this old boy shows up. I think we got pictures somewhere of this if they ever done, uploaded them. I don't know if they did. But at some point, this old boy shows up. By the way, look at that. Right through a tire. That's crazy. Remember, we're on tornado. By the way, those trucks don't look unusual except they were parked a mile away before the tornado. And that's why they landed in somebody's backyard. Most of the houses are gone. Most of the things are wiped out. That was, a, that was a town before. And as they're trying to help people, some of the houses left standing and some damage, and, but not many houses left standing. And as, they're, and as they're trying to help and they're trying to hand out things and people are just in shock and, and they're working with this local pastor, uh, an old boy comes up in a, in, a, uh, in a big old John Deere tractor. I don't know if you know about tractors. Brand new tractors cost a couple hundred thousand dollars. This is brand spanking new. Beautiful tractor. He, pull, he pulls up in this tractor one night, and because there's no electricity or nothing, he pulls up and goes, guys need, guys need some help. And he had behind it an old truck bed that had been turned into a trailer some back when, and in it he had a dolly, one dolly, because they're unloading everything by hand. And so he starts helping them in there, getting this done, and, and they're working hard and so on. And then, and he's been helping them for a long time, and finally they take a little break. And, and my brother turns to the pastor, the local pastor there, who, by the way, himself carried his daughter-in-law a mile and a half to get help. She's in critical condition still. A wall fell on her. And, and he says, what is the deal with this guy? Because the guy had on, you'll see in a minute, he had an old, a sweatshirt, dress pants, and, and there he is on the left. And you're thinking, why is he wearing dress pants? So the pastor there, and my brother, that's my brother on the right, uh, uh, your left, your right, my left, um, they had a moment, and he said to the pastor, who is this guy? He said, oh, he's a farmer. He lost everything. The only thing he's got left is that pair of pants, that sweatshirt, and that tractor. And he found the trailer out in the woods somewhere to help us. And he was there day after day helping. I just think if we as Christians... We're less concerned with lesser things and more filled with God's spirit and the spirit of grace. We'd be doing things that would turn our world around pretty quick. As long as we're in the fray being silly and trying to think that words are going to fix anything, we're missing the point. We need something supernatural to happen. You may need something supernatural in your marriage, in your family. We need something supernatural to happen in our communities. The polarization is unbelievable. But God's grace says that Christ came to bring peace on earth. 
that peace comes through the grace that causes us to not be ego-driven, fear-driven, even reputation-driven. Grace causes us to be God-focused, life-giving, gracious people. So this Christmas, I want to put you on alert. You have been graced. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to be gracious? Let's pray. Lord God, we love you so much. Thank you for coming. We didn't deserve it. We can't pay you back. But we can live in light of, every day, in light of, full of, so aware of the grace that you have given us that wherever we go, the light of your grace shines through us. Whether it's in a tornado devastated area in a part of our country or it's a relationally devastated area in a part of our family or Lord, it's a politically divided situation in our community. Your grace is sufficient. Let us be the church that is fearless, Lord God. The church that is triumphant, Lord God. Let us be the church that is effective in reaching people with the good news that there can be peace on earth. Lord, we love you. We thank you for coming. Let, let us, help us, empower us to respond to your grace as gracious gift receivers and givers. We love you, Lord. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you so much for being here. Don't miss, uh, don't miss uh, yeah, one of the services on Christmas Eve. It's going to be great. They may still need a few more um, volunteers for the 5 o'clock. If you, if you have an extra hour, love to have your help. God bless you guys. Merry Christmas.